Avast and man the yard arm to the Chugach let us sail, where mountain breezes ruffle golden nuggets in the dale, where glacier bears play leapfrog o'er the crag and through the bower, and nightingales sing a cappella hourly on the hour. No place more peaceful e'er existed, or fairly certain, the setting is pure paradise till Chilkoot parts the curtain. For Chilkoot Charlie, mighty hunter, man of vast renown, was noted for his gift to turn creation upside down. The fables of the Northland fairly bristle with such tales, so leave us to the Chugach, man the poop deck, reef the sails. Seems one winter when old Chilkoot reached the trapping grounds, he opened up his grub sack and he uttered fearful sounds. According to his plans, there should be many sacks of corn wherewith to make the mash for Chilkoot's booze. His soul was torn while sifting with his hand through what the sacks contained instead. It was popcorn. Chilkoot's eyeballs turned a vivid shade of red. Old Chilkoot made a solemn oath when springtime came about to leap into that store man's throat and turn him inside out. But there was naught to do. The snows had fell and he was stuck. He mixed the mash and delicately cursed his lousy luck. But lo, behold and witness, came the time for distillation. Chilkoot poured a dram and drank. A surge of rare elation proceeded through his hardened veins. Like old Sir Galahad, it had the strength of ten, but on his soul it wasn't bad. One drink and Chilkoot's beard reared back and toward the sky it went, then settled back again with many rustles of content. Another, and his ears began to flap like diesel powered. They banged against his giddy skull till both were cauliflowered. He gave an addled cheer. A golden medal should be struck for him who put the popcorn in his sack and rang him luck. From thence and through the winter, till the ice began to ooze, old Chilkoot Charlie constantly kept drunk on popcorn booze. Though this is some beside the point, it isn't really quite, because it was while plastered that he saw a wondrous sight. While reeling through the mountains in the search of table meat, some mountain goat, a protean he dearly loved to eat, he heard a rustling in the rocks, turned his gaze aloft, and what he saw convinced him that his brains were turning soft. Upon the ledge above, a billy calmly chewed an oat, a not uncommon sight, but this one was a purple goat. Time to time he'd had a touch of mental aberration, but this one meant his mind had gone on permanent vacation. He blinked his eyes, a kind of optometric SOS. When they focused on the ledge again, one needn't guess, there stubbornly and mildly grazed the self-same purple goat, except he now was chewing ferns he'd finished with his oat. Old Chilkoot had a simple choice, give up and go to pot or shake the apparition off and have another shot. He drank with one eye closed, kept the other on his nemesis, and saw the purple goat turn round and scuttle from the premises. To Chilkoot, never long nonplussed, there came a crafty notion. Alive and in a zoo, this purple goat did cause commotion. One merely need exhibit him, four bits ahead admission, and spend one sunset years in reading ticker tape and fishing. What golden fancies of the mind the thought of wealth releases. The visions that occurred to Chilkoot would have shamed King Croesus. Hot flashes came and went. The whiskey shipped on golden frigates. Snooze cans made of platinum with kegs with silver spigots. The castle on the coal buck, five star brandy in the moat. And there came the thought that first he'd have to catch the goat. He hoisted off the giant keg he toted on his back. Pursuing mountain goats requires a light and foxy pack. He worked with fevered haste, for there was scarcely time to lose, and from the keg into a flock of jugs he poured the booze. The curious may question, empty jugs are lying round? This region was the Chugach, Chilkoot's pasture, jugs abound. The spacious pockets on his bony hip, it's safe to guess, could hold three score of jugs, or even four, or maybe less. And so his burden shifted to a sensible position, he set upon what came to be a most historic mission. Though trailing goats to Chilkoot was like waiting for a bus, he'd done it for so long that it grew pure monotonous. This purple goat was singularly vigorous and frisky. The hunter often stopped to quaff a snort of popcorn whiskey, and 
ere the potent stuff had rightly settled in the hatch, resumed the chase with breathless haste. He found his purple match. Apparently uninterested in living in a zoo, this critter covered distance like a hot rod kangaroo. It left the Chugach country, proceeded south by west, with Chilkoot on its hoof prints like a meteor obsessed. The purple goat thus reached the Kenai, gathered in its hoofs and made a leap of leaps. O'er mountain, forest tops and roofs, it sailed in goatish majesty, and lit sand strain or pain upon the highest mountain of the vast illusion chain. The inlet fishermen, scarce credited what they were seeing, the goat who leaps the water, on his tail a human being, the critter led him through the Katmai country, leap by bound, and Chilkoot's tongue was flapping like a draggled basset hound. The winter and the spring went by, as time is wont to pass, when Chilkoot stopped to take a snort, the purple goat ate grass. The chase appeared a stalemate. In the meadows far below, the flowers started blooming. As the sun drove forth the snow, as summer in the Katmai tends to grow a little hottish, old Chilkoot swept as he performed his goat pursuing shotish. He made some leaps not matched in all the annals of mankind, yet the purple critter left him just one step behind. A lesser man would quit, but Chilkoot Charlie no such thing, just all the more determined when his odds are in a sling. The closer to the sun they got, the more the heat grew torrid. Lake Iliamna started from the sweat from Chilkoot's forehead. The heat was what undid him. He removed his coat, his shoes, his shirt, and kept his pants on, for their pockets held the booze. He noticed when he paused to take a soul-restoring nip, a bubbling and a boiling in the jugs upon his hip. And then it came, as quick as one can tell, a vast explosion that people heard as far off as the fertile land of Goshen. Flang old Chilkoot on his face. He lay there in the swound as mountains shed their boulders with a movement of the ground. His senses came reluctantly. The trapper rose and then another great explosion took and knocked him flat again. The purple goat perceived the sight. His joy was unconcealed. He laughed until the yogurt in his innards near congealed. Old Chilkoot rose again, and ere he'd had a look about, another detonation threw him briskly on his snout. He fumbled for his whiskey, and there rose like sudden dawn the weird solution to the case. His pants were nearly gone. Embarrassment diffused him in a wave from head to feet. The popcorn in his whiskey was exploding from the heat. And ere his wits were gathered, came another mighty blast that sent old Chilkoot through the air, his trousers at half-mast. As Chilkoot hurtled seaward like a giant cracker fuse, he tossed him overboard, the jugs of dread atomic booze. It was in the Katmai country, we're very pleased to say, that celebration first was held of Independence Day. Old Chilkoot kept in flight till his trajectory ran out, and when he landed in the bay, there isn't any doubt the tide that reaches 27 feet to this here day was started by our hero when he lit in Bristol Bay. The Valley of 10,000 Smokes, as tourists are aware, still features mighty blasts, a common situation there. The cause thereof, as is agreed by scientific men, is that those jugs of popcorn booze explode still now and then. What about the purple goat? Let's don't get in a sweat. The truth is that pink elephants were not invented yet.